You're watching Cartel TV and I'm Jenny. We've seen it before. Same models from different manufacturers with just different badges. But if you dive deep into today's global market, you'd be surprised just how often this happens. Today I'm checking out this awesome looking all electric EV6 from Kia in the top GT line trim with dual motors in Batman black. I'm Batman. <laughs> I'm not sure if it's actually called that. It's based on the same platform as the Ionic 5, and that's an awesome car that we're pretty familiar with. So throughout our review, we'll run through some comparisons of the two to see just how similar they are. It definitely looks different. The whole direction is different. The front is sharp and modern, and even has this kind of fake, cool, thin grille. It doesn't, it just mimics one. But there's actually no holes here. However, it makes the front look more familiar and that definitely helps. And you'd know by now just how much I can't stand those plastic fake EV grills. The LED headlights look sick with this kind of 3D thing they've got going on. And it matches well with the bumper, which is giving me Transformers vibes. This lower section actually opens and closes to help with cooling. So maybe it actually has some street cred to be called a grill. Finally, a functional grill on an EV. Who would have thought? The side looks particularly interesting. The 20 inch machined alloy wheels catch the eye immediately, but the black ascending line that goes from the bottom to the taillights, the bulked up wheel arch over the rear wheel. I really love how the window shape and the roof line slope combine to look, you know, really stand out, but not be feral. The side also shows the connection with the Ionic 5. I mean, you can see the overall philosophy is definitely there, although this has that edgier kind of grit. The rear is, well, Tell me what you think. There are parts of it that remind me of the outgoing Honda Civic design and this top spoiler part that flirts with the essence of Porsche or Porsche for normal people. I mean, it's definitely distinct and it's kind of like late 80s, early 90s futuristic vibes. I mean, I like it today, but will I like it in six months time? We'll have to see. What do you think? At the moment, there are two powering options. A rear wheel drive version has one motor which produces 168 kilowatts and 350 newton meters. The all wheel drive version has two motors and they add up to 239 kilowatts and 605 newton meters of that lovely EV torque. The lesser version is no slouch, reaching 107.3 seconds, but this one is 2.1 seconds faster. So that's a pretty significant difference. Both have the 77.4 kilowatt battery under the floor that weighs almost 480 kilograms. Charging from 10 to 100% within an 11 kilowatt AC charger takes seven hours and 20 minutes. 50 kilowatt DC charger fills from 10 to 80% in 73 minutes, while the 350 kilowatt DC charger does the same thing in just 18 minutes. Lastly, the official range of the rear wheel drive models is between 504 and 528 kilometers, while the all wheel drive one covers 484 kilometers. I mean, that's a little optimistic, but realistically you should get about 400 kilometers from this. I mean, that's plenty for every day and especially good around the city. However, the numbers mentioned a minute ago do not do this car justice. We mentioned just how different torque from electric motors feels due to its ever-present nature. It feels punchy and ready to pounce at any moment. Similarly, having two electric motors in this version, one for each axle, really does wonders for the amount of grip. However, you do feel the weight. It's not immense, but both versions are over 2,000 kilograms, so it is noticeable. The good side is that almost a quarter of that weight is in the battery, which is under the floor. So the center of gravity is really low. Now that is very nice. The EV6 does not feel like a boat on the waves but you definitely feel the weight during more spirited turns, even more emphasized by that amazing grip. Expectedly, there are a few regen braking modes, the strongest of which actually stops the car completely. It's great in the city. You just have to get used to the response and then you can use one pedal for driving in the city. The car feels significantly different to drive in different driving modes. They are called eco, normal and sport. And normal mode is by no means restrictive. The EV6 has really good pickup. The power delivery is linear and in practical terms, you will rarely need anything more. It will try to get you the most out of the battery, but without dulling the edge too much. Sport puts the EV6 on roids, completely ignoring efficiency. It just gives all there is to give in terms of throttle response and power delivery. Now, honestly, I'd only really use it for pretty sporty conditions, or if you want to give your passengers a bit of a thrill. 
Normal is more than enough for 99% of your sporty needs. Moreover, while this is currently the most powerful option, the EV6 will have an even more hardcore one. Now remember that this is the GT Line version. If they decide to bring out a GT full version, that'll give you even more. Eco makes the most out of the battery, so it does limit the power and throttle response. And I'd probably only use it when I need to make sure I'll reach the next charger. If you have no such issues, then I find the Eco is a little bit boring. But it's great if you do need to save on range. It's important to note that this car has single speed transmission and no adaptive dampers. In terms of driving, the different modes adjust the steering feel and power delivery and that's it. In terms of comfort, the EV6 gets a special Aussie suspension tune and it shows. In fact, the Ionic 5 will also get a suspension revision to get it closer to this one. Now this should tell you that this would be the more comfortable of the two options in Australia, at least until the Ionic 5 update comes out. The interior looks a bit quirky as well but it's also very practical. In some ways, it reminds me of some European models with the line that's running all the way from the steering wheel to the passenger door, as well as the angled and widened central console. It looks like a mix of ideas from some Audi and BMW models, but definitely a unique execution that does not make the EV6 feel like a copy of either. So the protruding frameless screen reminds me a bit of another manufacturer, but it is becoming an industry standard and Kia were on the bandwagon early, so that's actually a good thing. The difference is that this set of two 12.3 inch screens, each is curved and of course they feature loads of functionality and customization options. I also have to point out the very tasty Meridian Premium Surround Sound System. Quite nice. Also, the augmented reality heads up display is so cool. Apple CarPlay and Android Auto are still wired due to the issues we've already mentioned a number of times. It's not much of a practical issue, honestly, but I do hope that they fix it soon. This being said, Apple CarPlay is almost completely full screen, while Android Auto is smaller. Look, it's large enough to be practical, but the difference is pretty obvious. Apple users will have a much better experience. The rest of the software seems to work exactly the same as the Hyundai software in the Ionic 5. But the button placement setup is so different for both cars. I mean, it's almost opposite in some instances. Also, the gear selector is a circular solution here. But on the Ionic 5, it sits behind the steering wheel. They really paid attention to details, and it's a mix of those small things that make a big difference in the way a car feels on the inside. A lot of attention has also been paid to the eco side with vegan leather on the seats and some really cool top-notch recycled materials materials used in the interior. Now, while I like the interior design, it really feels premium and looks awesome. I have to say that the pure focus on interior space and functionality in the Ionic 5, for me, might just push it ahead a little bit. Not so much in terms of looks, but it is just such a unique proposal that I believe the EV6 would also benefit from this approach. Now, on the other hand, I can see that they can cover more of the market space with both options. Storage is ample. There are four cup holders, four bottle holders, one in each door, mat pockets, glove box, this storage box in the center console, as well as this separate tray. So under this central section, you have this huge space here where you could fit most moderately sized ladies' handbags but I do like the sliding solution in the Ionic 5, I have to say. There's also loads of space in the back. Legroom is huge, headroom is pretty good, and even the passenger in the middle will not be completely left out. The one thing that's not so great back here is the knee angle. I mean, I know the batteries are down there, but yeah, it's not great. Now, my other personal pet peeve is this plastic enormity on the back of the seats, and I don't know if it's, this is a handle. Practically, yeah, it's kind of good, but it's just awful. Like, come on guys, no, you can do better. So much better. The rear gets the standard storage and armrest amenities, as well as two additional USB-C ports on the sides of the front seats. The boot has 531 litres of space with a slightly elevated floor, once again, as expected for a vehicle like the EV6. 
Fold the seats and you get 1,591 litres of space and the floor is almost completely flat. It's really such a big and practical boot space and it has a low load lip and really wide opening. I mean, it's fantastic, especially for suitcases. I also like the separate compartment below to store cables in. There's also the front or the front boot, which is pretty small in both instances, but especially in this one, because it also has the front motor. It gives just 24 litres of space, not really much use, but I guess it's better than nothing. Expectedly, safety is certainly not lacking. A few of my favourites are the blind spot monitor, lane keep assist and lane follow assist, blind spot collision warning and blind spot collision assist, driver alert warning, autonomous emergency braking, and that awesome surround view monitor with 3D mode. This car costs about 83,000 and the rear wheel drive version is under 70,000. Is it worth it? Now compared to non-EV cars, it has a tough job. It's a lot of money but so is petrol at the moment. And if that keeps up, then this is gonna be darn worth a dollar in the long run. But is it different enough from the Ionic 5? Yes, they use the same platform and that's the best part to keep the same. After all, that is an award-winning platform that offers the basis to build a fantastic electric vehicle on. And both Kia and Hyundai have done just that. So the Kia is the option that's actually tuned specifically for Australian roads. So you get more on-road comfort there. So that's good. But in terms of the exterior and exterior design, they do feel very different. I like them both. And where the Kia feels sportier in terms of looks and layout, the Ionic 5 feels more elegant and a little more futuristic. For most buyers, it'll be a matter of styling and interior preference. And with both of these vehicles, you really can't go wrong if you're looking for an EV. The biggest issue right now is availability. Thanks again for watching Cartel TV. So which would you pick out of these two? And if not one of these, have you got another EV that you have in mind? And considering the current petrol prices, are you maybe looking at an EV now when you thought, well, maybe I wouldn't look for one for no, you know, two years or so? Let us know, people. There's a lot going on. Leave your comments below. We love to read them. And we'll see you in the next review.